for most people, jewelry is an emotional purchase. For most people, it's not just the surface reasons why people buy, and it's definitely not price for most people. Welcome to the Thrive by Design podcast. Hey there, I'm Tracy Matthews. I'm the Chief Visionary Officer of Flourish and Thrive Academy. Today on the show, I'm gonna be talking about why you aren't attracting the right customers. I'm doing a double. I don't usually record the audio and video this way when I'm doing a solo show, but I'm trying something new today. So please have forgiveness for me or leniency with me. This gets a little bit weird. We're gonna check it out. I'm gonna get my recording set up, ready to go. And we are going to dive right in. Welcome to the Thrive by Design podcast, episode 462. Hey there, it's Tracy Matthews, Chief Visionary Officer of Flourish and Thrive and the host of the show today. And I'm super excited. I'm gonna be talking about three reasons why you aren't attracting the right customers today. And more than anything, I really wanna support you in your jewelry business goals and to help you grow your business in a way that feels aligned and in a way that feels you know, exciting because you're confident in your marketing. And that starts with one thing in particular. And it's a big mistake that a lot of even veteran jewelry business owners make on their journey to building and growing their jewelry business. And it's interesting because I was chatting with my former co-founder, Robin Kramer. She had just gotten back from some of the New York shows And she's like, girl, so many of these designers need your laying the foundation program. And we started getting into it and we're talking about the reasons why. And part of the reason why I think that a lot of creatives like actually need the foundational work in their business, regardless of what their sales are. And when they skip it, it causes big problems later. Some of the reasons why they need this foundational work is because they did not think that they were going to have to become a professional marketer to start a jewelry business. They just liked making jewelry and wanted to sell it and build a business off of that, right? Am I right or am I right? And I know that the, I love, I wanna thank Andrea Lee for mentioning that to me one day, cause I'm like, you're right, that's exactly what it is. And so the big thing is that marketing is a huge topic in business. And while marketing and sales are two different things, like a lot of people say to me, you know, as long as the right customer is standing in front of me, I can sell to them. But what happens if it's not the right customer? What happens if you're trying to meet people online? What happens if you are in a scenario where you're having to like attract people to you and it's not just like the right people walking up to you? So I'm sure we've all experienced this. Like when we meet the right type of customer, it's really easy to sell to them. And we don't even know why, right? But if, we, if we're if we in this sea of the wrong customers and we're trying to sell to those people, they, it, they just don't land. Like our, the messaging and everything that we're doing doesn't land. And so you might be wondering why this happens. And I'm going to dig into three reasons. I mean, there's many reasons, but I wanted to keep this episode kind of short. I wanted to dig into three reasons. And the reason why I'm doing this episode is because as I'm recording this podcast, I'm also completely revamping our dream client clarity kit inside of our laying the foundation program. Now the laying the foundation program has been our signature for program for the last 12 years. And I've had many, many designers, six and multiple six figure designers come back to me and say, you know, Tracy, I bought LTF a few years ago. I didn't do it um, because I got busy. My business started growing and I'm realizing like my business is starting to like go backwards again. And I'm really like, I need to get back to the basics because I never really did it. And I might be good at sales. And if I'm in front of people, it's easy to sell. But then what about the rest, right? How do you create sustainability and prevent burnout because you are attracting the right people? And so we've welcomed designers of all types into this program, very established designers, and also people who are just starting out and everywhere in between who feel like they lack those foundational aspects when it comes to building the marketing aspect to their business. Now we do talk about collection development and assortments and some really basic stuff too. Um, collection development is not basic, but some of the some people who are trained, you know, maybe in fashion merchandising school know how to merchandise, but other people didn't take those kinds of classes, right? And so I can go on and on, but I've had multiple, multiple people come to me over the last month saying, Tracy, I bought LTF a little while ago, maybe a couple years ago and I never took the program or they joined our momentum program and they're taking laying the foundation because they already have a multiple six figure business. And they're like, 
oh my gosh, this is changing my life. I wish I would have known this in the beginning. Everything would have been so much easier. So the reason why I'm even recording this episode is because I am, I'm actually throwing it in. I had another episode planned for this week because I'm re-recording all of the trainings in our Dream Client Clarity Kit and inside of the Laying the Foundation program, as I mentioned earlier, and some stuff came up. And as I'm revising the scripts and going through it with my writer, I'm realizing like, yeah, these these are the core, the big misses that people are having. So if you feel like you need to get that branding foundation and marketing is not your gift, like you're really an artist, then I would love to invite you to join this program. It will change the game for you forever. It doesn't really matter what stage in business you are. And if you're someone who's just starting out and you weren't trained as a professional marketer, and you'd like to learn more about how to get in front of your dream customers, this will change everything. And we teach you how to make the money back. So if you're worried about the investment, like, please don't be worried. That's the last thing that you should worry about because we are on a mission. There's like three trainings that we give to you inside of it, plus a bonus called the Fast Cash Strategies Training that we give to you, all the new students who are joining this year, because we, number one, we want you to make your investment back. Number two, we know that some there are certain things that are tried and true. And anytime an artist is in like a like one of those sales dips, this is something that you can go back to. And number three, I just want you to be like enjoying the time that you're taking this program to really grow. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, head on over to flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash LTF. Right now is an excellent time to join this program because we are in the midst of like having Q and A calls and all the support that goes with it. And I think you're gonna really love it. So definitely check that out. And if you have any questions, of course, email us over at support at flourishthriveacademy.com. So, okay, why aren't you attracting the right customers? Let's dive into this topic. There's three reasons. Actually, there's probably more than three reasons, as I mentioned earlier. I'm saying three reasons. I'm gonna slow down a little bit because I'm talking fast because these were three that really popped out and came to mind, especially when I was like working through that first script and just recording that audio. So reason number one, you don't know who you're talking to and your marketing actually is a reflection of that. So this is really important. If you aren't attracting the right customers, take a look at your marketing. Like, do you know who you're talking to? Do you have a vision in your mind of who that person on the other end is? Do you know what to say to those people? Do you have clarity around that? As I mentioned earlier, once again, you didn't sign up to be a jewelry maker or designer or business owner necessarily to become a professional marketer. And in fact, many of you who took marketing in school probably didn't learn a lot of the things that you need to learn to market a product. It's very different. Uh, you might be marketing on your features instead of the benefits of what you have to deliver. You might not understand the emotional reasons why someone is buying from you. You might not even understand like, who that person is, like, how old are they? Like, what is their demographic? Do they have kids? Do they not have kids? You know, how much money do they make? Like all of these things. And I know this to be true because a lot of people, and this is something we're gonna talk about a little bit later. A lot of people think that people buy jewelry because of the price of the jewelry, which is the least, that's like the lowest thing on the totem pole. And if you're competing on price, you've been doing it wrong because you are not Amazon, you are not Target, you are not Walmart and nor should you ever be. You can never, you'll never be able to compete with a big box store. Also, you're not Alibaba. And you gotta, you gotta really be thinking outside of the box or thinking a different way about who these people are. And so when you aren't, you don't know who you're talking to and your marketing reflects this, what happens is you have marketing that's very vanilla. And what that means is that it just doesn't land with anyone. It's just blank, meh, like, oh, it's not polarizing. Oh, it's not really capturing my attention. Oh, it's scroll past. Like no one's gonna stop and look at it. And without an, a deep understanding of the motivations and like the underlying reasons why someone's gonna buy jewelry from you, you will always struggle with this. I'm sorry, like you're never gonna just get past it. You might have some sales in person, like when someone gets in front of you because you're like connecting on the vibe or whatever it might be. But if you really wanna sell online and you wanna be able to pitch wholesale stores, like this is key. And so here's an example. I see this all the time. Even some people have good businesses and it drives me bonkers. They're targeting or they think that they're targeting middle-aged women and they have teenagers as their models. Raise your hand if this is you. 
teenagers as your model. Yeah. So someone who's going to spend like several hundred dollars on a beautiful gemstone necklace with like sterling silver or gold or whatever. It's probably not a teenager. Teenagers are not shopping there. They're shopping off of TikTok and teenagers might be wearing some Gorgiana because my niece wanted that, but they're, they're probably not spending like something like the kinds of pieces that I make, you know, $5,000 pieces or something like that. Nor would, should I be using a beautiful teenager as my model? Because it doesn't make sense. It's not who the, the end consumer is. And I know that people do this because they have a daughter or they have a friend with a daughter or they, they have a cousin or someone and they need a model and, and they can't necessarily afford to hire a model or they don't know someone who really fits the bill of what they're trying to do. And so they're just like, oh, well, a teenager is better than no one else. And it's confusing to people. So if you're using teenagers and you're not targeting that person for modeling, you are in like really doing yourself a huge disservice. Now, another thing, like another thing too, is like, let's say that you, so there was a student in our community a while back. She thought that her jewelry was for really edgy fashion forward women, but she created, she designed this really beautiful, like dainty pearl jewelry, which is really catered more towards Christian conservatives. <laughs> That's the best way that I can emulate it. But when, so when, every time that she would tell me who she thought her dream customer was, I was like, mm, I don't know how to tell you this, but I don't think that's who you're really targeting. Like this, this jewelry is not going to land with those kinds of people. Mm, Middle-aged housewife, maybe, uh, who goes to church every Sunday, probably not the edgy girl with the crop top and, you know, who's out, you know, going to like raves or a heavy metal concert, just totally different kind of vibes. Right? So, if you don't know who you're talking to or you're using visuals and imagery and all these other things that uh, don't land and resonate with that person, you're doing yourself a huge disservice because it's not going to help. Now, reason number one, you don't know who you're talking to and the marketing shows that. Now, number two, you're trying to cast too wide of a net. So talking to everyone is really talking to no one. And a lot of people are really concerned or nervous or stressed out about trying to narrow the lens too much because I think that they believe that if they narrow the lens too much that they're missing out on opportunity to market to a bunch of people. And I can understand that and I totally feel that and that's not to say that you might not have more than one dream client avatar or person who would shop from you over time. And I'm not going to go into the complicatedness of having multiple avatars who shop for your brand. But let's say you just have one product line and you're like, well, it, I sell to teenagers. I also sell to tweens. I also sell to celebrities. I also sell to high end socialites on Park Avenue. I also sell to people in college. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense because the way someone is going to consume when they're in college versus the way someone's going to consume if they're a New York City socialite versus the way someone's going to consume if they're a busy mom on a budget is very, very different. That's not to say that you won't have the socialite and the mom and maybe a teenager here and there or a college student here and there buying a piece of your jewelry, but that's not the, the main customer for your brand. And so the reason I be believe people do this is that they're worried about, once again, casting too narrow of a lens. They don't wanna exclude anyone. But I hate to break this to you, everyone is not your customer. Even though lots of different kinds of people buy from you, they're not the ideal customer. And so what we're trying to focus on is to get you narrowed to the person who is a dream customer who buys from you and then buys from you more than once. So if someone just buys from you once, that's a sale, it's a transactional sale, right? Someone buys from you over and over again, that's a customer for life. You will increase your average order value, the lifetime customer value and the longevity of your brand and it'll be a lot easier to grow your business. This is why getting clear on who the right people are is so important. And so I think I'm going to share with you two different stories. So I was working with a jewelry, a jewelry student a while ago who I'm like, okay, who, let's talk about your dream customer. Who is it? She's like, well, it's Gwyneth Paltrow. And I was looking at her jewelry. I'm like, it's not Gwyneth Paltrow. But like, how do you break someone's heart like that? Right. And, she, you know, we're exploring this. And a lot of people want celebrities to be their customers. Celebrities get paid to wear products. So a lot of the products that they're even wearing aren't necessarily pieces that they would even pick out for themselves. They're just getting paid to wear it. 
And occasionally, like celebrities will go into a store and buy your stuff, which is totally cool. I used to live in LA, and before Cameron Diaz was famous, she came into this little boutique that I was working at and bought a ton of jewelry. And I remember thinking, I'm like, that girl is the same age as me because we must have both been like 19 or 20 at the time. And I'm like, she's spending $400 on a necklace. I'm 52 now. So $400 back then is like $2,000 now. Uh, my mind was blown about it, but I don't even know why I'm saying this. this is a little bit of a tangent, but the point being is that celebrities do shop and they will buy jewelry. Um, and they're usually shopping at the stores or the outlets or the places where celebrities shop. So if you wanna to sell to celebrities, your be best chance in selling to a celebrity is to get into stores in LA and New York where celebrities shop. That's a whole nother ball of wax. And the whole point of me telling you this is kind of a random tangent, but celebrities do actually purchase things and they buy products and they shop for them. But the stuff that you're seeing on the celebrities out there is a paid placement usually, especially if they're mentioning the name of the designer. And I want to be very clear on that. I've seen this over and over again. And now if you want Gwyneth Paltrow to be your customer, probably your best chance of getting Gwyneth Paltrow to be your customer is to be able to get into her store or on her blog, Goop, which you know now it's famous, so that's gonna be really hard. And I'm saying this like tongue in cheek in the whole thing, but be realistic with yourself. Gwyneth Paltrow probably isn't your customer. And a lot of these celebrities aren't necessarily your customer. Now, if you wanna to try to get your products placed on a celebrity, that's a different story and it's pay to play for the most part, or you gotta get in with their stylist, one of the two. Now, another story that I have here is a story of Barney's. Now, Barney's was a store that I really wanted to get into for a very long time. And it's closed now. It's been closed for many years. It went bankrupt a couple of years ago. I think it went through bankruptcy twice in the time, like in the last 20 something years. And in this last bankruptcy, they actually shut it down. So when I was selling at trade shows, I met the Barney's buyer. And this is when I first started my fine jewelry line. And they came and looked at it. And they were also looking at my ready to wear products. And they asked me a bunch of questions. So where are you sold? Who carries your collection already? And I was like, super proud. I'm like, Sundance catalog twist, you know, listing all these names, Bloomingdale's and, you know, cause I was trying to impress them. Well, little did I know at the time, I, I didn't understand this because I didn't research Barney's enough. I just knew that I liked to shop at Barney's. I liked the products Barney's had, and I really wanted them to sell my jewelry because I knew a lot of other people who were being sold in Barney's and it added a lot of prestige for them because they got a lot of publicity and press and lots of people like to shop at Barney's. So went down this rabbit hole, ended up like pursuing this buyer, trying to get her to respond to my emails for probably two years. I spent so much time and energy on that account and other accounts like that. Had I known what I know now is that number one, Barney's probably was never going to be my customer. And even though I love shopping there, the type of product I was designing and the customers that shop at Barney's probably weren't going to buy my jewelry. The second reason is, and. It, and that's that's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow but i once i was honest with myself i was like oh my gosh yeah probably not you know if i was looking at the other brands that they carry the other thing is this is that barney's likes to dis like to discover brands and so i didn't know this at the time but because i was already in twist which would be a comparable store to barney's because i was already in sundance catalog because i was already in bloomingdale's these are all technically like not necessary direct competitors, but competitors enough that I was well known enough that they wouldn't want to carry my brand. And I spent years of my life probably trying to get into that store or days of my life, maybe weeks of my life. And I tell you this because if you aren't clear on really who your dream customer is and you're casting too wide of a net thinking that all of these people are going to be your customers, you're going to waste a lot of time. It's going to be very frustrating. It's going to actually affect your sales in a negative way because the energy that you're putting into something that's not a good avenue for you is actually taking away from focusing on places where there is a good avenue for you. And this is where like when you kind of find something that works, like double down on that because that's so much better. And so if you're casting two out of a net, remind yourself that not everyone's your customer. And Barney's well, it's not around anymore, but Barney's isn't your customer probably either, <laughs> or maybe it's some of your customers, but you know what I mean. Anyway, just be honest with yourself because that clarity will change everything. 
Now, the third reason is a lot of people don't know what really matters to their customers to the most. Now, earlier, I spoke about competing on price. This is a huge one when it comes to this. Most people aren't buying jewelry because of the price point. You know, like obviously there's going to be limitations, like someone who can afford a $200 necklace might not be able to afford a $10,000 necklace. Obviously it's different price range and gamut, but within your price range, it's not necessarily that the cheapest always wins. And here's why. So I'm a consumer, like I like shopping. If something's inexpensive, I think it's cheap. Mentally, my mind goes to that. Like if, if it's under like a certain price point, like let's say I tried on a blaze, like I looked at a blazer online and it was only $100. And I have like a $600 really nicely tailored Veronica Beard blazer that I've had for years that I know is gonna last. Would I buy the $100 blazer? Well, only the only way that I personally would buy it, this is someone who's a consumer, I shop a lot. I mean, not that much, but like, you get it. Like I like fashion. So the only reason why I would buy that cheaper hundred dollar blazer would be if it was something super trend forward and it was only going to be in style for one year. I don't like fast fashion. I like things that I can keep and wear and use for a long time. I love quality over quantity. So cheapest is for someone like me is never going to be the deciding point. And I think that that's true for a lot of people. It's not to say that I wouldn't buy like something cheap and cheerful, but it's just technically not me. And anytime I've ever purchased jewelry from someone else, anytime I purchase costume jewelry, it technically will sit in my jewelry box. And that's not to say there isn't a market for that. I'm just saying like someone who consumes products like me. So with that being said, what matters most to me is quality over quantity and getting things that are really nicely made that are gonna last a long time. So I just, um, you can see this on video, but you can't see it here. Shout out to my girl, Jill Jarmel of JB by Jill. She has a jewelry line that I love and I found this beautiful leaf necklace. I'm not gonna tell you how much it was. It was an investment uh, with these diamonds. And I was like, I put it on in her store when I was doing a VIP day with her. And I, I'm like, I can't take this off. Like, I love it so much. And it's, it was an investment, but at the end of the day, I was like, I know that I'll wear this almost every day. And so I want you to think through the eyes of your customer, what matters most to them? Usually it's the emotional attachment to the piece of jewelry. There is something to be like the design and the style, like people like things that they like, right? The, the look and feel. Also jewelry is an emotional purchase. Like when I put this leaf necklace on, I was immediately attached to it. I don't know why, like there's symbolism. I keep calling it a leaf. It's actually a feather, but like there's symbolism. I love the way it feels because it has like movement. And it kind of reminded me of some of the stuff that I designed back in the day, but it's different. It's more elevated. And so I feel a connection to it. And there's, I don't even know what that connection really is, but I just feel connected to the piece. And so what I'm telling you is that for most people, jewelry is an emotional purchase. For most people, it's not just the surface reasons why people buy. And it's definitely not price for most people. And so this is a great example of this. We have a student who is a Langley Foundation graduate. She, per she purchased the program and went through our pricing module and collection development module. And so she used to do a lot of shows in Santa Fe, huge artisan community. She had her jewelry displayed at an art show. And after two days of making no sales, like many people, Allison was really frustrated. She was frustrated because people kept walking into her booth complimenting her on her jewelry, trying on the jewelry, looking at the price, asking Allison, what is this made out of? And when she'd say sterling silver, they put it down and walked right out. And she could not wrap her brain around why. She's like, they're just leaving. Maybe it's too hot. Maybe it's too expensive. So she decided to do something crazy. It was the last day of the show. She ripped off all the price tags and she doubled the price for everything. Just blanket doubled the price. She wasn't using any calculations, which I don't recommend, but just did it for this. By the end of the day, or like within a few hours, she had sold every single piece of jewelry. You know why? Because the perception of quality aligned with the price of the piece of jewelry that she was selling. So if there's not a, if there's a mismatch in perceived value of what it, the consumer thinks it should be, your products won't sell. So selling things for less is actually probably doing you a disservice. Selling your pieces too high will also do you a disservice. So 
you have to get the right price to attract the right customers. So let me recap these three reasons. Now, there are many other reasons, but I wanted to keep this episode fairly short and walk through and share some of these stories is number one, you don't know who you're talking to and the marketing shows it. Number two, you're trying to cast too wide of a net. And number three, you don't know what matters most to the customer, which it's definitely not price. So I hope that was helpful. And if you're someone who would like some support growing your jewelry business and you feel like you don't understand these concepts and you would really like to dive deeper into not only understanding the motivations for people buying, you wanna learn more about marketing and how to use emotional drivers in your marketing to inspire more sales, more conversations, and to create more engagement and ultimately just grow as a business owner, then I'd love to invite you first to take our Laying the Foundation program. If you've already taken that and you'd like to continue on with us further, then to book a discovery call. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about the Laying the Foundation program, it's our 12 week signature program. It is game changing. It will literally change your life. Just head on over to flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash LTF. I'll also have the link in the show notes in the description wherever you're watching this or listening. And if you'd like to learn how we can help you a little bit more based on where you are in business, just book in a discovery call with my team. Head on over to floristhriveacademy.com forward slash discovery and book in a call today. And let's talk about your business and see where you're going and identify how we can get you there a lot faster. All right, it's Tracy Matthews signing off. Until next time, thanks so much for listening to this episode. Ciao for now.